You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. This episode is presented to you by Purina Pro Plan and Boss Shot Shells. It's really all about the connections, the friendships, and basically that overall connection you have with your dog. And our dogs are with us for such a short amount of time. It, you know, NABDA really gives people that foundation, whether you're testing or not, to get out there and enjoy and keep building on that relationships with your four-legged and your two-legged uh, friends. So um, use the system. That's why we have it, and it's onward developing and volunteer. Keep helping out so that we can keep growing that membership and keep growing these opportunities for for people like your listeners out there to have for that next generation of hunters, no matter what your age, you can start hunting no matter if you're young or if you're upper 40s, 50s, 60s. It's never too late to start hunting and start working with bird dogs. Hey, bird dog babes. My name is Courtney Bastion, and I am obsessed with all things bird dogs. And I'm here to share with you the stories, experiences, knowledge, and opinions from the women and a few guys in the industry that are killing it. I'm a Wisconsin girl living in a Montana world, mom and two incredible kiddos, wife and occasional assistant to a pro gun dog trainer, traveling the U.S. talking about canine nutrition while hunting, raising, and competing with my German wire hair pointers and Brocky Italiano. As someone who started hunting later in life because I wanted to give my dogs the opportunity to do what they were bred to do, I'm here to help inspire, educate, and connect women to get their bird dogs out in the field and experience a bond like no other. So pour yourself a glass of wine and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Bird Dog Babe Podcast. Today we are talking all things NAVDA Natural Ability Test with Angie Coonan and Lisa Pior. NAVDA stands for the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to promoting and improving the versatile hunting dog. The natural ability test is for dogs up to 16 months old. No game is shot and no retrieves are required. There are four phases of the NAVDA NA test, which include field, tracking, water, and evaluation of physical attributes. This is part one of a three-part series. We will go on to utility and utility prep in part two, then the invitational in part three. This natural ability episode is a lengthy one because it's jam-packed with what a novice and experienced handler need to know about all four phases of the test, and it's also the most thorough explanation of the NA test you'll probably ever hear. We also touch on how to prepare for the day and some advice on how to get the most out of your NAVDA training days. All right, let's get after it. This episode is presented to you by Purina Pro Plan. What makes a great bird dog is genetics, training, and nutrition, and that's why I trust and feed Purina Pro Plan. With over 500 nutritionists, veterinarians, and scientists on staff, ProPlan delivers a full spectrum of performance and specialized dog food formulas to help bird dogs like yours excel at every stage of life. Purina supports us, the breeders, owners, and trainers, the events we compete in, our national breed clubs, canine health research, and our committed partners to conservation groups such as Pheasants Forever, Rough Grouse Society, and Ducks Unlimited. 95 out of the top 100 dogs are fueled by the advanced nutrition of Purina ProPlan. This episode is also presented by Boss Shot Shells. Copper-plated bismuth boss provides a better, more effective non-lead option than steel and are safe to use in grandpa's gun. Available in 10, 12, 16, 20, 28 gauge, and 410, direct-to-consumer pricing and cases ship right to your door. Shoot boss, pattern your shotgun to make more clean and ethical shots, reduce crippling, and remove lead from the uplands, wetlands, and all lands. Find out more at BossShotShells.com. 
A big shout out to the people and the partners that are helping me to keep the MP3s rolling for this podcast. My Patreon patrons, the bread and butter, the peeps, the community of like-minded individuals that are eager to learn and offer to contribute. Join us for $5 per month on patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe for exclusive discounts, content, and live Q&A sessions. 5% of your contribution goes to the AKC Canine Health Foundation and another 5% goes to conservation. Dakota 283, unparalleled protection for your dog's travel to and from your next adventure. My favorite is the G3 Kennel, which has a recess handle on top that makes it easy for me to lift in and out of my truck. The keyed panel latching door makes me feel at ease on trips when I have to leave dogs in my truck when I stop for fuel. An added bonus is the drain hole in the back, which makes cleaning a breeze when my dog has been run hard and put away wet. Go to dakota283.com and use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for 10% off. And by Siren, shotguns for women. Siren carries the only full line of women's shotguns. They are dedicated to providing the equipment and knowledge that makes shooting and hunting more enjoyable and less stressful. Newer season hunter, Siren offers multiple options that fit right out of the box. No more compromises. Go to SirenUSA.com and check out all the options available for upland, waterfowl, sporting, and trap shotguns. And while you're there, say hello to Julia, Siren's new 12-gauge sporting that is one of the most stunning shotguns I've laid my eyes on. Also buy Big Frig roto molded coolers with heavy-duty latches, dual stainless steel lock plates that double as bottle openers. They also have dry boxes, tumblers, and growlers. And my favorite, the ability to customize the tumblers and coolers. Head to thebirddogbabe.com forward slash bigfrig to view the wide array of sizes and colors available. There's a Badlands cooler perfect for your way of life. All right. Good morning, ladies, and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Good morning. So what I want to do to start this off, um, I'm going to have each of you just say a little bit something about yourself and what you do for the NAVDA organization to give our listeners a better idea of um, the insight that you're bringing today and how you've come to that position to be able to bring that to us. So uh, Angie, why don't you start off first? Sure. Um, My name is Angie Conan, and I am the secretary for NAVDA International. Um, I've been involved with NAVDA since 2003, Um, became a NAVDA judge in 2010. Um, Somewhere around the 2014-15 year, I was approved as a NAVDA senior judge, Um, and then around that same time, a NAVDA um, invitational judge. Um, my husband and I raise German short hair pointers, and uh, we have a kennel called Hurricane Kennels. Um, we've been going at that for about 10 years. Um, it's come with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, but uh, through NABDA and our friends, we've been able to build that. So just super excited to um, be here and talk more about our testing system and really what got all of us involved and in how the testing system can help uh, your listeners. And my name is Lisa Pure, and I'm the registrar for NAVDA. I've been involved with NAVDA since probably about 1994. And from there, I just took on a lot of chapter duties, got really heavily involved with the chapter, did uh, secretary work, test secretary work, did the newsletter, and just learned and how much fun and how much you can get out of NAVDA. You know, learning about how to train your dog and how to handle your dog and, and seeing the um, different ways of training a dog. So I just, it's just, it became something that I really, really enjoyed doing. And after having gone through a few tests and watching what the judges do, I aspired to become a judge. I wanted to be out there and learn more and see more handlers and see more dogs. So in 2002, I became a judge for NAVDA. And then in 2010, I became a senior judge. Um, from that point, like I said, my, my love for the, for the organization and dog training and being around dog people just kept growing. And one of the things on my bucket list for, at that point was to become an invitational judge. So I've been fortunate now to be, be able to judge invitation a few times and I hope to keep, keep doing what I'm doing. So tell us, um, what breed do you have? I have German short hair pointers. All right. And you have a, a girl due next 
a girl do next week. Um, what's your what's yes. your kennel name? Shooters, Shooters Short Hairs. And yes, we have a, um, a young girl. She's uh, three right now, and she's expecting a litter. It's due next week. And uh, today is our x-ray day, so we'll find out how many to expect. Very <laughs> exciting. Um, so, yeah. and speaking on invitational stuff, Angie, you are running the show for the invitational. And um, I know this year there's there's um, a little bit of a pivot everybody's making and, and changes. And I, it seems like every couple of days we're getting a new update through the email on what's going on with the invitational. Can you do a touch point right now on... Um, What's going on? What can we can expect? Some changes that have been made? Sure, sure. Well, the Invitational is pretty much like the Super Bowl of, of our testing organization. And it is a little bit extra this year because we're, we are actually um, testing the dogs that qualified. So in order to qualify for the Invitational, you need to get a prize one in a utility score. So you go to a NAVDA test. If you get a prize one, you'll get invited the following year to run at the Invitational. Again, it's the Super Bowl of all dog events within our organization. And because of the pandemic last year, we had to unfortunately cancel our Invitational in Iowa. Um, but those dogs that had qualified in 2019 had the opportunity to come back this year in 2021. Well, when NAVDA opened up their testing system back up July 1, we had a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of dogs qualify in 2020, um, just about as much as they did in 2019. And those 2020 dogs had the opportunity to either run this year or they could choose and go to New Mexico where the Invitational will be in 2022. So the Invitational, obviously, again, the Super Bowl of all dog events, um, I, it's one of my committees being on the board of directors for NAVDA. Um, I have a great committee of 12. Deb Stott is our program coordinator. Um, so Deb and I have been talking on a daily basis because um, you're right, things are ever changing. Uh, we never dreamed we would have this many dogs running, but NAVDA's philosophy is to, you know, if you want to run your dog, we want to be here for you to run your dog. So um we're there. We're getting ready. Uh, we're trying to do it so we don't wear out our volunteers. We don't wear out our judges. So we actually, um, the Invitational this year, um, we've extended it. Normally, it's a four-day event, a Thursday through a Sunday. Um, this year, working with the local chapter, so it will be back in Grinnell, Iowa, with the Hawkeye chapter. The Invitational will be September 12th through September 18th. Um, and each day we'll run through each part of the test. Um, again, these are some of the most elite dogs, um, in our testing organization. So we're very excited. We have about 240 dogs running this year. So it's going to be quite the feat to get it, uh, laid out and get it ready to go, but we're excited. We have a great team, a great chapter supporting it. And then we're excited to head to New Mexico, New Mexico in 2022, um, so that is for, again, any of the dogs that qualified last year that decided to go to New Mexico and not run in Iowa and any dogs that qualified this year um, will get invited with, again, qualification is a utility prize one score. Um, we'll get invited to New Mexico, which is brand new for us. We're excited to have it in the West. Um, generally, it's been between um, Iowa and Ohio, Ohio. Um, and so this year, uh, I'm sorry, next year then we're excited to head out west and head out to New Mexico. So, um, yeah, we've got a great awesome. committee and um, I'm excited for what this year will bring, but it, it's going to be awesome. Again, NAVDA is based on volunteers and we could not pull this off without our volunteers. Um, any test from natural ability all the way up to the invitation, NAVDA is a volunteer based organization. And if we don't have volunteers, um, we don't exist. We are not judges, we don't have tests. We just, again, I say that every test I judge, I mean, they are the backbone of our organization. Um, and so it's very important. And I also like to point out, whether you're running natural ability in the Invitational, you know, every single person that's planted a bird for you or shot a bird for you is volunteering their time. So I ask people just to pay it forward. Even our new people, you learn so much running natural ability that first day, you're just so excited and you don't know what to expect. Um, you go out there after, hopefully you've worked with your chapter a little bit. And I know we'll touch on that here coming up, 
Um, but boy, if you're testing, if you could just pay it forward one day by planting a bird or making a meal, it's just going to keep our organization running and uh, keep growing. Um, we're hitting almost 10,000 members within our organization, which is truly wow. amazing. So we're yeah. very excited for the future. And to give people an idea, you said there's uh, um, 240 that are running this year yeah. or qualified for this year. That, that have quali- that are running. So there's that more running. than that that have qualified. Yes. Okay. And so not everybody many, chooses. Okay. So how many on average um, have are in a test uh, are in the invitational test in the past? Um, on average, it's about 120 dogs. So oh, wow. So we're at double. Yeah, we're at double, but you figure we didn't test at all last year. Um, So, yeah, we're definitely at double. Um, At one point, we were a little bit higher than 240, but we've had a few people drop, um, which is to be expected with that many dogs that are running. So, yeah, it's going to be quite the feat organizing um, the Invitational this year um, with 240 dogs and the amount of volunteers and judges that we'll need each day. And how many dogs can run in a day? Well, it depends how many fields you run. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong here, Lisa, but um, we can generally run. Um, so if you're running three fields and that's what we're planning to run and you run six braces in each field and each field has two dogs, right? So you're running about 12 dogs in each field per day. So you're looking at about 36 dogs a day max that we're going to run. Okay. Okay. And are the judges, um, are they going to switch throughout the week then? Or will the same judges be on assignment every day? Um, generally, they're, they switch. We switch things up. But you're going to have your same field judges throughout the day. Um, it's going to be really hard to ask a field judge to sit in the field for seven days. So they may be in the field for two to three days and then maybe go sit at the water um, and work the blind site or the double mark site. So um, generally, I think we're going to work it this year. So judges will rotate. Um, but, you know, generally field judges will rotate out again, like I said, probably every two to three days. OK, we're working right. on that now. All right. And so um, this is going to be kind of a three-part series with NAVDA in this podcast. So this one is focused on natural ability. The next one, we are going to do a utility and um, utility prep. And then the third one will be the invitational. So when we get to that third invitational one, we might have more updates, but we can get more in depth with how that works. Um, so let's start biting off a chunk of this piece of natural ability. <laughs> <laughs> with this. Um, so the natural ability test, what does that test prove? Why do so many breeders want their puppies tested through natural ability? What can owners gain by training and testing for natural ability? Would you like me to start? Yeah, hop on it. <laughs> All righty. Well, to start, there's a few, it's a few things that are involved with that as far as what's there to prove. So, or what you're trying to prove with your dog. Uh, the test itself, it's, it's measuring seven inherited characteristics of, the, of each dog. So it's what we think or what, what truly does help make a reliable hunting dog. So when you get through a test, what you're getting is the judge's evaluation of each dog. It's a snapshot in time, of course, but you still get a really good idea of, and it's an impartial evaluation of the dog's strengths and weaknesses. And it helps for an owner, first off, when you go into judge, into testing and a natural ability, you learn, it's, it's the beginning of the bond with your dog, and you learn so much about your dog, and you build, start building that partnership at a young age. So you're taking your dog to areas where there's other people, other dogs, you get the opportunity to try different things with your dog as you're watching other people test or train. And you may try those things with your dog and see how it works out. There's just so much knowledge to be gained in that early development stages of those dogs. So yes, they do have the inherited traits that you're looking for when you're, when you're judging, but it does take the exposure and some training to get your dog to the point to be ready for a test. You know, your dog, even though it has natural abilities and natural instincts, doesn't mean you put him in the field and he's going to know to hunt. 
He's got to learn that. So that's what the owners gain from. They gain the camaraderie of the people within the chapters. They gain uh, so many different ideas or ways of training to help them train. And the dog learns how to become a hunter. Like I said, it's early development, but he learns all those basic things. It gives you the opportunity to introduce him to those basic, basic things to help that dog grow within his, his hunting career. Yeah, it's a snapshot. You know, I try to tell puppy buyers, it just proves to us as breeders what we're doing is working. Um, it helps us determine, again, like Lisa said, if there's something that we thought looked great on paper, you know, confirmation-wise, field-wise, water-wise, but then, you know, when we actually, puppy buyers are able to go out there and test, it, it's a good, good snapshot of that dog. But it's also a good snapshot for you as the puppy buyer. I mean, I think it builds so much of a bond with your puppy. It gives you that opportunity, again, to know what you're going into hunting season with. Um, I'm a hunter as well, and it's amazing to me when I can take a five-month-old puppy and put him on a track. And I know we're going to talk about that soon, but, you know, to watch a five-month-old puppy track a wounded bird, that's the whole reason that we do that and why we have that in their testing system is just to see actually what we're doing as breeders is working. And it's such a great evaluation, more so than the breeders. I think it's you as the owner of the puppy. It builds that bond that you have with your puppy. You know what you're going to have, um, a snapshot, what you're going to go out in that field and you're going to see that hunting season. And then it gives you that snapshot of things you've got to work on. You know, we, both Lisa and I have seen it. You know, there's some puppies out there that, man, when they reach a certain age, like right after nine months, it's like a 16-year-old with a full tank of gas and keys to the car. They're just going to go. And, you know, we've got to be able to hone that energy. Um, but that's what this test will give you, that good snapshot picture. And I also encourage your listeners to talk to judges, to talk to us. Yes. Um, it's so important that you understand what we're doing out there and that why we're looking at a certain thing. And I know you're nervous. I get so dang nervous at a natural ability test um, all the way up to the invitational. I ran all of our testing system and I get so nervous. So both Lisa and I and all the NAVDA judges have been where um, some of your listeners may have been when they're getting ready to test. So talk to us, you know, ask us why, what we're looking for. And if we can't tell you at that moment, we'll let you know. But that's what the end of the day is for, is to sit around with us and find out, you know, where you can go and where you can improve from there. So it's just a great, great snapshot of what overall dog you have. Mm -hmm. And and I want to add to that, even on a, on a breeder's perspective, um, you know, several times puppies can leave here at eight weeks old and have a perfect bite. And um, or have a bad coat or a great coat or have one testicle. And in that evaluation, so much is um, noted there. You know, maybe the bite went off. Maybe that testicle descended. Um, you know, maybe that coat improved or got worse. And so all, all that extra stuff that is done um, in that besides the, the, you know, the field, the water and the tracking that tells a breeder, a lot of things too, on what's being produced. So yeah, I like it from that standpoint too. Yep. Um, yep. so what does a typical day of the natural ability test look like? So, you know, as, as a novice, uh, maybe I've never been there, uh, to, to watch a test beforehand and I'm showing up and I'm ready to test my dog, what, walk, walk the day, walk me through the day, what it's going to look like. I'm, I know I'm getting there early. Yeah. Yep. It's a, <laughs> I think that some of the misconception with some of the handlers, I know I'm the test secretary for a two natural, two day natural ability test that we're going to be holding at our house at the end of May. And I have some brand new handlers and it's very interesting for me to talk to them because they don't understand that this is an all-day event. You're there at 6.30 in the morning. Um, you check in. Um, that's when you'll get some judges um, opening remarks. Um, and then generally every judging team usually consists of three judges, a senior judge, 
and two other judges. Um, a senior judge is just either picked by NAVDA International. You may have additional senior judges there, but they're that senior judge for the day. So they're, it's their job to lay out the test. Um, and so some senior judges lay it out differently. Generally, um, you may start the day out in the field. Um, and then after that, after the field, you may go to the track in the water or you may vice versa and go after the field, you may go swim and then go do your tracks. It's just, again, based on how the grounds are laid out, where we have access, do we have to travel? That's all taken into consideration when that senior judge is laying out the test, but it's an all day event. So I tell handlers to plan to be there from sun up till probably, you know, if all goes well, three thirty, four o'clock, just depends how many dogs are running that day. Um, there's so many variables. And when you ask what is a typical day, I think I've been doing this now, like I said, I know I've been doing for 10 years, there's no typical day. Um, we generally know how it's going to lay and how it's going to work out, but there's always a curveball. Um, I'm always learning every test. I'm learning, I'm adjusting, I'm working with my team to say, okay, the wind isn't the right direction. We've got to change how we're doing this track. Or, you know, oh my gosh, the the entry for the puppies for the swim isn't quite right. We've got to adjust and go to a different side. Or, oh my gosh, it's pouring rain right now and we're supposed to be doing field. Maybe we got to adjust and go swim puppies, right? Because it's pouring rain and you want to, we're there to help to get the very best out of your dog. And so we're never going to put the dog or the handler in an area where it's not going to be advantageous for them to do well. Cause we're, we're based on a standard. It's not, my dog is no better than you, Courtney, or you, Lisa. It's based on a standard. We all start out with all of our eggs in a basket and we want to try to help you keep them there. Is there ever a, an order where it's um, like water is always after field or tracking is always after field. Is it ever that, or, or are those no. three portions of the test always interchanging? They're always interchanging. It's going to be a judging team. They're going to get together first thing in the morning. We'll talk about it beforehand, but first mm -hmm. thing in the morning, because now you know what the weather looks like. You know if it's foggy out, if it's raining out, and at that time they come to a consensus on how we're going to run this. And that after they've done all that and they got every, all the volunteers ready and set up for that portion, whatever portion it may be. Then they, they talk to the, the group of people, all the handlers, and they give them, you know, their thoughts on how the day is going to run. But they also always throw in that disclaimer that it may change, but this is what our plans are right now for today. Yeah. What about on a cold morning? Will, is it possible that people need to prepare that my water or water might be the first thing of the day on this cold morning? Yeah, absolutely. Again, we're, we're changing it, you know, and that's things that as a handler, you have to prepare for. Um, and, you know, the one thing about the natural ability test is, is exposure, but not too much exposure, right? You want to expose your puppies to cold water. You want to expose your puppies to maybe a, a cool morning where there's dew and it, the birds might get a little wet. Um, but you don't want to overdo it too. And, you know, and that's the great thing about a NAVDA chapter is the NAVDA chapter is going to help you with that. Um, I judged a test a couple of weeks ago and um, the puppy owner's dog had never seen the type of bird we were using, um, never really seen any birds. They just brought them out. And so at that point, you know, I had a nice conversation with the handler and they were super excited by the end of the day. They actually bought two checkers from the chapter because they were going to end up retesting their dog. So it's really important, too, that your puppy is exposed to all different kinds of weather, um, birds, scenarios, people. Even the simple fact of riding in a crate or being on a stakeout um, at a test is something that you can practice with your puppy way before you even show up to a test. And I know it's not always easy for NAVDA people or members to get to a chapter training day, or they might be two, three hours away. But if you can try to meet up with a chapter member, even over the phone and try to talk to them the best that you can and, um, Take that drive that's two or three hours. I can guarantee you guys birds make a bird dog. And the more the exposure that you can give them without overdoing it, and I know we're going to cover that, there's a fine line there, 
prior to the test, the more you're prepared you're going to feel. Um, and the more, you know, the better the, the outcome that you're looking for, for the day. Right. And I look at even, um, you know, realistic hunting scenario. If you're going to take that young dog out duck hunting. You're out there early in the morning in the cold water. So True. if you can, um, you know, if an NA test is what's going to be to tell you that your dog is going to hesitate to go get that duck, then, then so be it. You'll be prepared before you sit out there the first morning in the blind. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, let's, let's start with the field portion of the test. So you have uh, 20 minutes Correct. in the field and there are how many typically, is it always trucker? Not always. Uh, no. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you'll have, um, how many birds are planted out there? Well, it, it depends. So we're going to, we're going to seed the field the way I, I like to call it. We're going to seed the field so that first dog that runs out, we're going to make sure that there's birds out there. And again, it's based on the judging team and we take it by um, a day by day basis. But generally for me, and I don't know, Lisa, you, you can say what you do. I generally will put out at least six birds for that first dog. And then after that, we take it on a bird by bird or, you know, dog by dirt dog basis. So the next one that would run, maybe we didn't get all the birds up and I'll talk to the bird planners and say, okay, generally put the birds in the same area. If you see a bird already there, you don't have to put one down. Um, but it's usually, I mean, in my experience, I'm always putting out four or five birds for every dog because we want to make sure that they get into birds. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to make sure every puppy has the opportunity to smell that bird and point it. Um, so that's kind of how I lay it out in the morning when I talk to my bird planners. And I do the same thing. I, when I go out there, you start out with, you always start out with more because you know for sure there's no birds out there and you want to make sure that the dog has plenty of opportunities. And um, after that, it's again, if you see, you have one dog goes out there and maybe he only finds one bird, you have a pretty good idea there's more birds out there, but you, you can only assume that. So when the bird planners are out there, it's the same thing. You tell them if there's something there, leave it. But if there's not something where the area you, you thought there was a bird, make sure you put one down. Because the big thing is, and you tell, we, I'm also the test secretary, and part of that is preparing for the test and getting the birds situated. And you have to plan for a lot of birds because you just never know. But you do plan at least four or five birds out per race or per dog. Sure. And I think um, a common misperception that, that I've heard a few times, um, you know, if someone's dog will go out and find five or six birds and, but maybe they didn't hold them staunchly on point, but they're like, well, I, my dog found every bird in the field. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have one or a dog that finds one bird in the field and works it perfectly holds, you know, holds point. And so when the scores are read at the end of the day, you're like, how did my dog not do well there? And the dog that only found one bird did. So can you guys get in a little bit about what is expected in that field portion and what exactly as a judge do you want to see that dog doing there? To put aside just the bird question that you had, um, I'll touch base on that as well, but just to give a, a, a broad view of the test itself in the field portion is, you know, we're judging particularly we're judging use of nose, search, pointing, well, not typically. We're judging the dog's use of nose, the search, pointing, desire, and cooperation. But you also want to see a dog out there who is going to come from the exposure and knowing why he's there and that he's going to find birds if he looks hard enough. You want to see that enthusiasm, and you also want to see some, some independence in them. Now, I'm not independent to the point where they just want to go like crazy and, and get out there and do their thing on their own. But enough independence to be able to get away from the handler and have have that maturity to go and investigate, find areas that look like it might hold a bird, and they investigate the different areas so that they know that you know they're looking for a bird. They've been exposed. So when they do come upon a bird, though, the amount of birds that they find doesn't matter. Okay, you might have one that finds all six. You might have one that finds one or two. It's how how they worked when they found that bird. The pointing portion, the dog must must um, be intense, 
convincing and unmistakable on point, and in the end, produce a bird. So if he does all those things, it doesn't matter if he finds five or if he finds one. He's going to get the score for that bird. Um, if he does it five times, but he only does it really clean on one and then falters on a couple others, meaning it took him a few times, he had to bring him back downwind again to help him get in there. That's all going to play a part in the scoring, but the number of birds really doesn't matter. It's how, how they work that bird. How do they find that bird? How do they use the nose to get to that bird? And search as well. So there's a lot of things involved with that. So number doesn't matter. But um, as far as the, the rest of the test, you'd be, like I said, you're being judged on, for instance, desire and cooperation throughout the entire day. But the field portion, when you're in the field, then you're going to be judged on, again, no search, pointing, desire, and cooperation. We're looking at all those things. Yeah, I generally, so when, when people come to the line um, and it's their first time, I, I usually tell them we're going to go on a 20-minute hunt. And I, I tell the handler, handle your dog like you normally would. Um, if it's too much or too little, we're going to let you know. We're there to help you through the test. And then I'll ask if your dog's been shot over before. Um, and what we're doing there is we're just checking for any gun sensitivity. Um, and generally, you know, people have exposed their puppy to some gunfire, um, and there is a correct and wrong way to do that. We can get into tips and tricks on that here at the end, but the big thing is, is that you've exposed. Um, so then, then we ask to make sure you have some water with you. Um, even if it's a cold day, you want to make sure you have some water with you. Um, to me, that's just a good connection that you have with your dog. If you're trying to get them in, um, there's generally water tubs out there. Even if it's a hot or cold day, it's a good chance for those dogs to cool off and regain their composures at some time. And then we take off in the field. We'll call for those two shots right away. And then we're, we're basically hunting. And like Lisa said, you know, we're looking for once they make game, how did they, you know, use the wind? Um, sometimes birds just pop in the air and it's not the puppy's fault. We don't hold that against them. We take all that into consideration. And again, whether they found one or six birds, it's how did they work those birds? And that's the best thing about NAVDA is you have that opportunity to redeem yourself. So maybe you get out there and right away they're so excited and they just push that bird up, right? We call that a takeout. They were downwind of it. They ran in and they never pointed it. Well, at that point, that's a zero in pointing, right? But there's more birds out there for you folks, so don't let your heart sink and go, oh, I'm out of this. That's not the case. You have that opportunity to make it up. So then the next time, your puppy may go on point. And then once they go on point, then that counts as a point. So now you're building your basket back up. And the one thing we do tell handlers is when your dog goes on point, don't say whoa or stay or no commands. We just want to see what the dog does naturally because... If you woe your puppy into a point, we can't judge pointing because we don't know, did the dog do it on its own or because you told it to, okay? And then after that, you know, we see how the day goes and that's why the judges are there is to help you. If right away they're hitting their points, we may say, hey, go ahead. If now you're starting to work on more advanced training, go ahead and you can hold the dog and we'll try to help you flush the bird. Or, you know, we give the handlers that opportunity or would you like me to hold the dog and you can go flush the bird? It, it just it's, depends after that point. If they've already proven that they can point a couple times, then we help you even during the test to what's what's to come, what's next, Right. Um, so again, you have that opportunity to make things up. So if your dog runs out there and pushes up a bird, you know, the judges are there to help you. And it, as long as we can see the dog, these are puppies, folks, you know, they can test up to 16 months of age. So we have puppies that get in there at, I've seen them as young as three months old, four months old, which is very young, but people do it all the way up to, you know, close to that 16 month range. And so there's so much growth and exposure that is happening and that's the judges team the team is to make sure that they help you through that test at those certain points so the big thing is don't get discouraged um, get out there ask questions and uh, again let's try to fill that basket back up because we can make sure that those puppies are doing the very best that they can in the field what are you looking for on the point is there should you be able to count to three? Um, 
what's a flash point? Like what is acceptable as far as uh, establishing that that dog pointed the bird? Well, like Lisa said, it's got to be intense, convincing, and un, you know, unmistakable a point. Um, different breeds point differently. Even in short hairs, you're going to have some short hairs that have a 12 o'clock tail, 11 o'clock tail, a three o'clock tail. You know, if you look at a clock, which way that their tails might be. Um, you want to be able to know that, yep, there is game there. That dog is on point. And um, I've seen it where dogs are maybe 25, 30 yards out, but you see that they're on point and all of a sudden the bird pops up or they take the bird out. That's okay. Um, I wouldn't say that we sit there and we count. Um, that's up to the judging team as far as did we realize that, that a bird was there and that's part of our training and part of the continued workshops and continually judging that we do is really understanding. Now, if I have to look at you as a handler, meaning your dog gets in the area, but they're standing over the game and their head's moving and their butt's moving. Well, is that, you know, intense and convincing? Do we know that they're on point? Or, you know, if I have to ask you, is your dog on point? There's a question there, right? So we want to just make sure, and it, it doesn't, sometimes puppies, there are certain breeds where that tail just likes to a little bit twitch or wag. That's okay, we know that there's a bird there because we're going to ask you to flush it or the puppy is going to flush it on their own. So again, it's got to be that, that convincing and unmistakable point. And I can't stress enough to at least expose your puppies to birds prior to getting out in the field. Um, you're going to know what your puppy looks like once they go on point. Cause all of a sudden it's going to hit you and you're going to like, Oh my gosh, that is so cool. I didn't know they could do that, especially first time, hunters and, and test people that are testing, you know, just getting out there and training and seeing it, you're going to know when your puppy's on point. And so are we as judges. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I have to, like to add, it's you know, as far as my experience is too, is when we're out there and we see a dog on point, if you have long enough time to say that dog's on point, and again, you're not counting, but you can, you see it and you acknowledge it. It's like, that's enough. You know, so you don't, you don't put a time limit on it. It's like, you, you don't want to say a flashpoint where it just, starts coming into a creep and the bird goes up and it takes off. It's like, no, we're going to we need to try it again. But we want to make sure there's opportunities for that as well. And if it's truly a dog that's maybe doesn't have a good of a point instinct or hasn't developed at that time, you'll see it, you know, because you're going to try and get that dog as many birds as you can. So you can, you know, in your mind, you know what you saw. You know what I'm saying? So it's very clear. And then you give the dog another opportunity. It comes right in, wins in a better direction. So he gets that good smell and he stops on a dime then you know, it's like, yeah, that's, a, that's a, the dog's got the instinct. It's there. Yeah. And I would say too, if there's ever a question in the judge's mind, um, let's say it's a windy day or we've only had a couple of birds, you might have the judging team say, we're going to call for a bird for you. So we're going to put a bird out because we have a slight question, you know, in our heads on, on pointing. Um, and so we'll put a bird out so we know exactly where that bird is and we will work you right into the downwind side of it. And that will give us a really clear picture if we had any question in our mind. Or again, if it's a windy day, we're going to call for a bird. And that's not a deduction. Just because we put an extra bird out, we're just trying to look for something that we haven't seen in the field. Again, this is natural ability. These are puppies. Um, so we're out there to see the very best in your dogs. Mm-hmm. We'll take the time because it's a 20 minute test, but that's not, that's a guideline for us. It's got to be at least 20 minutes, but if we need that extra time to see everything we need to see, we're going to take it. We're going to make sure every dog. Yeah. Out. Yeah. That's a good point. I'm I glad that you it. both added that to it as well with the timing and even how you're trying to set the dogs up for success. Um, and I can say from, from those that might be coming from the AKC venue, where if your dog, you know, does something wrong, it, you know, it's done, it's, it's out. And so it's, it, it is good. It, and it, there is that transition to know that um, you're not going to be thrown out. I, I don't think it, no. uh, have you guys ever had to throw a dog out? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I score it all based on percentage and how well that dog yeah. It, and, so and even like in mean. utility or or natural ability, you know, if they're out there busting birds, well, you you got you got you got to keep going. Just <laughs> that's that's why we have the time. Again, you have the opportunity, and that is just the cool thing about Navi. You have the opportunity to better yourself. 
you yes. know, and, and judging teams are going to see that too. And sometimes dogs come out and they're really good in the beginning. And then they learn that, Ooh, that shot color isn't on anymore. And wow, I can, there's birds out here, but as a judging team, we're going to see that. And so we may direct you in the field and say, how about we go over here? Or, you know, how about you hold your, and that's that point, not when I talked about earlier about holding your dog is we know that they have the point in them at that time. So we're not going to, we're not out there for you to start creating bad habits. So we're truly out there to help you and help, you know, keep those eggs in the basket or build it up if we need to. What about for the gun shyness test? So within the first couple minutes of the field portion, um, like you had mentioned, Angie, you, the judges asked, have your has your dog been shot over yet? Um, But you have somebody that is between, I would say what the gallery and then the dog and the judging team and handler that is going to put two shots uh, from a shotgun into the air. Can you go into that a little bit more? I'll start. I can start with that. So the way we start off the test is you need to get these two shots. We don't need to get the two shots, but you intend on getting two shots fired. And we'll do it at the beginning because we don't, we hope to get the shots out before we get into birds. We don't want that to be an influence. So when your dog is, you first cut your dog loose, um, the judge is going to, the judge that's handling you is going to signal to the gunner I'm going to fire. And what the judge is looking for at that point in time is you want to see that dog within the area, but going away. And then you'll, you'll signal for a shot and you're watching the dog's reaction to that shot. So the dog is going to be judged in the end. It's either going to be not gun shy, gun shy, or gun sensitive. So a dog, when we say gun sensitive, you can see there's a distinct, distinct reaction to that gunfire, but not to the point where even he may stop and pause and look concerned or not want to hunt for a second. But then maybe we're just like, all right, pup, come on. You can bring him out of it and he'll go back to hunting. But then when you get to a, a dog that is gun shy, what may happen is that dog is going to run away, leave the field, come back to the handler's side, and he's done. He just he just does not want to hunt again. And it's affected him to that point. So you need to get the two shots off in order to be to in order to be judged not gun shy or gun sensitive. But a gun a gun shy dog, if you only get one shot off and you can't get that second one, he's definitely going to be marked gun shy. You may get the second shot off, but usually a gun-shy dog, the reaction is so distinct that we don't want to cause any more trouble. You, you may not want to get that shot off. Or you may wait until you can get that dog in the field, get him relaxed again, get him on a bird, and, and then go from there and see if you can get a shot off. But again, it's it's a very distinct reaction to the gunfire. What about gun-shy versus gun-sensitive? Well, again, I, the gun ahead. sensitive dog will go back to hunting. He, it's a momentary lapse in his hunting. He gets distracted. He gets concerned, but he'll break out of it. And again, something I didn't add is the recovers recovers slower, recovers quickly. How how fast does he recover from that reaction? So, a gun sensitive dog, like I said, it may may distract and may may concern him, and he slows down. He's kind of unsure of himself. But then with a little bit of encouragement, you can get him back to hunting and he forgets all about it and you're able to get another shot off with really no more than that. Angie, do you agree with that? Or yeah, not? yeah, absolutely. You know, and it all plays out in the so A gun shy dog generally then, um, you'll see it. They just stay close to their handler. They, you know, it affects their search. It affects their pointing. So that's why it's super key in the beginning, um, exposing your puppy to some sort of gunfire. And, you know, it's really important when you're training for that, that you don't overdo it. There's all of us, I think, can talk about horror stories that we've seen. Um, But I think the exposure to gunfire is very important and it's done correctly. Um, I suggest new new puppy owners, new into hunting, get with a more experienced person that has tested dogs before or maybe a, a NABDA chapter. Again, just, you know, exposing those puppies to gunfire. And, you know, Courtney, you may do it one way and Lisa, you do it one way and I do it one way. And there's really, you know, with gunfire, there is right and wrong. Um, but you just want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that, um, 
is not going to hurt the dog it, because that lays the foundation for the puppy's life. And that's why we're checking for it in the testing system. Hold up just one second so I can tell you about our new launch of the Bird Dog E Academy. William and I have designed a school for bird dog owners and breeders, like legit classes, where a new module drops every week. You get a checklist, weekly assessments, and follow along with videos of several different dogs. After going through the beta phase with students, we have launched the Reliable Retrieve course. This course follows the progress and struggles of four different dogs with four different personalities. This is a little to no pressure course. You will learn to read your dog and decide which option is best for them. The best and most unique part of this course that no other online dog training course has ever offered is you will get a hundred percent support. Weekly live Q and A sessions, a private Facebook group for you to ask questions, post videos of what you and your dog are working through, and watch other people and their dogs to help you become a better overall trainer yourself. This is a big commitment for a pro trainer, and also the reason that this particular course will only be offered three times a year and is limited to only 50 people. We start the reliable retrieve on Monday, April 19th. So head over to BirdDogEAcademy.com to register. Let's move on to tracking. The yeah. the most what variable portion of the test? Yeah, <laughs> you know, for me, it's most variable. And when I was first starting out as an apprentice and a new judge, it was the hardest part for me to really judge. But I've judged well over a thousand dogs now, and it's gotten to the point where you can definitely see it. And you definitely, you know, know when there's that gray area. Um, I have to say, part of track is again, you don't. For me, and again, this is the cool thing about NAVDA. We all have different ways of training. And if you know you're a new puppy owner, you talk with different people. Just take what works for you.、Um, just because I do it one way, and Lisa does it one way, and you, Courtney, you and Bill might do it one way. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just what works for us, and we're sharing that information. So, for me, when I do it, when I'm getting my puppy ready, I start out when they're young.、Um, I take a duck and I pull some flight feathers and I let it run through my field, and then I have a little feather pile. And ducks are really stinky, and I'd like to claim we do not use ducks in a test, but this is for the <laughs> training part of it. And it really teaches that dog to put their nose to the ground. And start learning their nose and start doing track. So what is track? So when I go to a NAVDA test and I'm a judge and I start telling people about the track, I say it's simulating wounded game. So when you go out there and you shoot a pheasant like I do and you wing it over half the time like I do, you need a really good bird dog to help you find that game. And so what we want to see is in the beginning of that puppy's life, do they have that tracking? Desire ability,、um, so you want to expose your puppy to it. So when you come to the test, we're going to take a pheasant generally,、um, pull some flight feathers on one wing, and then we're going to lay a scent down. So we're going to take that bird and we're going to pull maybe some breast feathers or maybe off the back. Different judges do it different way. It smells like a bird, and we set it on the ground and we let it go. And generally, it runs off. And your job as a handler is to bring those that puppy in, and the judges are going to tell you where the feather pile is. They're going to say which way the wind is going. So we're not we try to lay the track so it's not downwind. It's usually a crosswind, and you bring that puppy in, and the feather pile's right there. And the big thing, if you're a handler, is one you've exposed them to it, so you practice this. You want to practice it one or two times at least.、Um, And two, how you let the dog go. So if you're going to feel that connection, you know your puppy. So when their nose is to the ground and they're pulling your arm, pretty pretty sure they're on that track. But if their head's in the air and they're like, "Ooh, Tweety Bird," or "Ooh, Butterfly," because they're puppies, right?、Um, bring them out of that track and start over. We don't start judging till you let the dog go. Okay, once you let the dog go. Then that's when judging starts, and you can't say a word. Now we just want to see what happens with the dog. So the big thing in the test for me that I've seen is that release. It's so important that you get that release in there. Don't push the head down. 
Um, I've seen some people try, you know, different ways of releasing and stuff. And that's great. Do what works for you, but make sure they're connected to that track. Again, we don't start judging. It's not bad if you got to pull them out of the area where the feathers are and just take a breath and start over. Um, and then generally you sit there and you watch and it's up to the judging team to see what they, they see. Because we see where the pheasant goes. So we know if the dogs crossed the track and didn't acknowledge it or it did. Um, and the one key point I love to make about track is your dog does not have to find the pheasant. I have had so many, or chucker, whatever the judging team uses, I've had so many people be so upset because they think they, they bombed the track because their dog didn't find the pheasant. And I think that's one thing as judges, is we need to be more and more re-encouraged. Your puppy does not need to find that bird. Some do. Some do find it, and it's not always a four track. Um, it just, how did they find that? Did they find it in a search, or did they actually track it? And that's the judging team's job is to figure that out. But just because your puppy doesn't find it, we say, okay, handler, you're done. And you're like, I've seen so many handlers like, oh, and shake their head. And I, I have to reassure them because I want them to finish the day strong is everything is fine. They don't need to find the bird. So really keep that in mind. You know, it, it's what we're seeing in the field. And again, sometimes they find them, sometimes they don't. One thing I like to encourage people when they first start training for tracking with their puppy is this test primarily is about the nose and the concentration. And people have this, this you know, comes, they have, they have this feel or need to get their dog ramped up. They want to get the dog all excited and like, kitty, 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 tap, tap, tap. It's not, that's not doing your dog any favors. It's all concentration. It's focus. It's more of a calming thing. So when you start out training and, and on test day, it's track, whatever word you use, however you do it, you show the dog with your hand, you bring your hand from the nose to the ground and they'll typically follow that hand to the ground and show them the scent. It's track, track. It's calming. You know, you don't want to get them all ramped up because then they're just going to want to go. You know, I mean, these dogs, the first thing they typically learn is, is hunting. And that's a lot of running and a lot of looking for the scent where the tracking is, you know, calming. You take them to the scent and you have the concentration and focus for them to keep their nose going down that same track. The nose doesn't have to be to the ground, but using their nose to follow that ground scent to get to the to the destination. So, and like Angie was saying, it's not about finding it. It's about progressing forward on that track. So like, like I said, that's just a, one of the things release is very important, but I also think keeping that dog calm is, is equally as important. Absolutely. And a couple other points, you know, the judging team will tell you, you have that opportunity to show your dog um, the bird, if you would like to see it. Um, some handlers you know, they've never exposed their dogs to pheasants. Um, most of the time in me personally, when I'm running natural ability with my puppy, I don't want to show them the bird because I, just like Lisa said, I don't want to get them overexcited. I want them to concentrate and to use their nose and, and to put it down. Um, one thing I'd like to add too is sometimes puppies will get on a track and they'll point a pheasant. You can get credit for that point. It's a secondary credit, but you can get credit for that. So for example, maybe I've seen it where a dog in the field, it's a questionable point. Maybe we're at a two, but they get on the track and their dog tracks it and points that bird solid. That could could again raise your pointing score because you can get credit and sometimes you're going to see judges like once your dog goes into the woods if you see your dog or a judge walk up and look in the woods it's because they're probably looking for a point um, and they want to give that dog that extra credit for that point in the field so again that's the cool part about NAVDA they have the opportunity throughout the test and the field portion to, to better themselves um, and this all plays out on the on the scorecard. And also, you learn a lot of this, too. So if any of your listeners have a chance to go to a NAVDA, NAVDA's Handler's Clinic, this is some of the stuff that it'd be really cool to show you and show you what it looks like. And then you have a good understanding of the testing. But just keep in mind, if your puppy points, that's a little extra credit, too, in the field. Um, I'm sorry, if they track on, if they point on the track, it's a little bit extra credit for them. Yeah. I, we've even had a dog um, years and years ago where I think he busted every bird in the field portion, but he pointed the pheasant 
in the tracking portion. And so he was, it wasn't just, yeah, it wasn't necessarily even extra credit. It was like, Oh, that's that, that counts as your point. Yep. Yep. Another, yep. other places where the scores can cross over like that is the field. If you can come across a track. So if it, while you're in the field, if the judges see a bird scoot out from an area and they see that the bird run, so they see that there's a track laid there and the dog picks up on that and follows that track. You can get your tracking done right there in the field as well. So huh. they, well, yeah. scores can cross over like that. As you may see, <laughs> as judges, when you're looking for uh, an ideal tracking area, because I've seen at several tests where um, it's planned, this is where we're going to track today, but then you get there and you're like, nope, that's that's not going to look good. So then they go mm-hmm. try to look for another field to do tracking. And what is it specifically that judges are looking for? as an ideal uh, cover for tracking? Ideally, what you'd like to see, the field you use, you'd like your field to have at least room for a 50 to 100 yard track. Now, you don't need that distance to get your tracking score, but just for setup purposes, ideally, you'd like to have that kind of space. And you also want your cover to be about 8 to 10 inches. But you have to keep in mind, or the judges keep in mind, we're judging all across the country, and you're going to see all different kinds of terrain. So those are ideal situations. You, you, you just need to do the best you can with what you have. But you do want to look for areas that you don't want to find areas that have a lot of brush or a lot of bushes because that's where the bird is going to go. So you'd like a nice open field, uh, a good 50 to 100 yard area to, to lay your track and with about 8 to 10 inches of cover. What about yeah. a transition area? Like, do you... Do you want to see if it's grass? Do you want to see them be able to make that commitment um, from grass to go into wooded cover? It's not required. I mean, if you can set it up that way and and the fields give you that opportunity, you can certainly do that. And um, again, and like you said, it gives you the opportunity to see if the dog will take that transition, but it's not a requirement. You can do it grass or or not. You can do it. I've had them do it where it's a very, um, wooded area just because that's what they had and that makes for trouble because you have obstacles so you try and stay with anything like that but you want you know a a nice cover and and consistent if possible and if you have the higher cover or or woods to go into you can do that yeah like lisa said you know we we go all over the country and i was judging a few weeks ago in san diego and there was no wood line we were working in irrigated fields um and so i had a field in mind for track and we were getting ready to do it while there was too much irrigation to the point where the fields were almost flooded so i did change um which field i worked the track in and go find a different um, field to do it and there was no wood line for us to run into and let's face it too when you let a bird go it doesn't always go in a straight line um, we'd love to see them go into the wooded line and we'd love to see that puppy break cover and go in there um, but it doesn't always work that way um, again it's just how far are they advancing are they covering the same area over and over is that scent enough to bring them into the next part and cover new territory and again you might be trying to run that pheasant right into a wood line and it might take a hard right or hard left and go right up the field right so as long did that puppy make a turn and advance a little bit um that's what i'm personally looking for um, when i'm judging track so it's not always i always try to draw a picture in my mind and say okay if it was me and i shot a bird and it landed, how far, what's reasonable that I would want that dog to go. And I try to always put it into a hunting perspective because that's what, again, what we said in the beginning here is we're getting dogs ready for hunting season is, you know, is, are they covering new ground? Are they advancing? Um, That's what I look for. Let's, let's touch on some of the, the crazy things that can happen in a track. So, Mm -hmm. and and I think the judges uh, typically see it. And, and can let the handler know, but, you know, when they're trying to, uh, you know, clap and get the pheasant to run out there in a straight line, they might take a 10 foot hop yeah. <laughs> or the pheasant that takes a hard right and does a loop behind the judges and then goes off somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these are, and I, I'm just saying like, these aren't necessarily things that you can train for or prepare for, but just know that things can happen. And because people get nervous when they see their dog go off behind them, just come to find out that the judges said, yeah, the, the pheasant went behind us. 
Yeah, and and we take it on a we take it on a dog by dog, bird by bird basis. Um, I've let a pheasant go before, and it it's died right in its track, right? So now we got to call for a new bird, and we got to move down. Um, I've had birds run from you know maybe ten yards away and hunker down, or not even ten yards, five yards away and hunker down. Um, we've had birds go behind us, um, and if that's the case, if we ever feel that it's a deterrent to the dog or it's a hindrance, we're going to rerun that track. So if there's something that comes up and we're like, that just wasn't right. When we say we're going to rerun your dog, it's because there was a situation that we didn't have control over. Again, the bird maybe didn't go far enough where we could judge tracking. So we lost track of the bird. We thought it went, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 yards, but instead only went like five yards. Well, that's not far enough to judge tracking. So we're going to rerun it. Even though your dog found it, we're going to rerun it because we want to see that good distance of tracking. Maybe the bird did loop behind us and it worked well. Um, you know, generally the judging team is going to say, okay, the bird went that direction. And then if you, if I'm working with you, I'm saying, well, it did kind of loop behind us. You know, so as long as we see the dog actually tracking it. And if we tell you to come back at the end, because generally we do reruns at the end, it's a do-over. Okay, it's it's a do-over. We're starting fresh. It was nothing to do with the judging team. It was nothing to do with you as a handler or your puppy. It's just it was a, a bad situation that we were trying to set up. And you generally sometimes set up situations don't always work. So we're going to do it over. Um, and so we're going to look for the best that we can. And so sometimes, I again, I've seen handlers like, oh, my dog did so bad. They brought me back. No, we're starting over. I like to tell handlers, this is a clean slate. Let's start it again because those situations, because a pheasant dies, it hunkers down too quick. We can't judge tracking. It goes in a weird way and it just didn't work. Um, I had a volunteer once eating a sandwich. And what do you think that dog did? It started tracking that went right to the person eating the sandwich. You know, way, and even though the volunteer was way back, it just, it, it smells that sandwich. And so what, what breed do? of dog was that? <laughs> It was a Spinoni. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. And I'm like, okay, we're going to rerun that track. <laughs> you know, you know, even though the volunteer was far enough back and there was no birds in the area, except for that hot scent, it just, it got deterred. It went off. And that's the one thing too. handlers, they let their dog go and all of a sudden their dog goes into a search or they go behind us and they're like, oh no, they're not tracking. But what does the dog do once it does get on the track? You know, we give a lot of time to make sure every opportunity and we, you as a handler, we may say, okay, we got to refocus the dog. Let's move up a little bit. Let's try to advance them on that track. So we're trying to help you um, get them a little bit further because they, you know what, they did go off and do a search and these are puppies are chasing Tweety birds. Let's try to get them refocused. So when your dog's coming towards you, take a few steps forward and let's just see if we can get them back on that track. So there's so many different things and so many variables that can come up in a tracking situation. Mm -hmm. And even the weather, um, we had a test here last year where it was, it's generally dry in Montana the way it is. Um, but one day, not one dog passed the track. Uh, it rained that next that night, and the next day, a little bit wet conditions, and every dog passed the track. So, you you know, the, what can you do? There's so many unfortunate, ver- I shouldn't say unfortunate, but so many variables in general that can that can happen. But when you're te- when you're hunting, you're going to have dry days in Montana hunting too, right? <laughs> Does it so find the bird? Absolutely. And a a, a test day generally, we've all been there. You know, how many times have you heard my dog's never done that? I mean, (laughs) if I had a dollar, have you heard that? (laughs) Well, if I had a dollar, I I work for the university system. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that or said it myself with my own dogs, I probably would have to work. So Yeah. I mean, it's just weird. It's testing. There's things that happen that is out of your control. And it's also the environment you've got, you know, generally, if it's an all day natural ability test, you got 10 dogs out there with owners and handlers and trucks and volunteers. And it's a lot. It's a lot of pressure. And your dog, too, knows, can feel that pressure from you. 
So yeah, it's so many variables, but in the end, you know, again, going back to the beginning, we're just trying to see really what your puppy has from natural ability and helping you see that overall picture for you, yourself, and the breeders. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's jump into that, that last portion, the water. And what is it, or I guess walk, walk us through um, what that water portion looks like when you, you're walking up with your dog and the judges tell you what? So when you come down for the water, you, you know, judge will greet the handler uh, before the water and then walk them down and give them some instruction down the way. Uh, the, the chapter will provide some bumpers and there'll be uh, a variety of types of bumpers that you can use. And when we just tell the handler, in this portion of the test, you can get as animated, as animated with your dog as you, as you want. Get that dog excited. Make that dog happy. So grab a bumper, get your dog excited, and then we just, all we want to do is see the dog swim. It doesn't have to go on a search. You know, you just want to get it out there deep enough so the dog has to get all four and swim. So you do that. You know, so they take the leash off, grab the dog by the collar or, or, or not. And then get the bumper, get them excited, toss it out there, and hopefully the dog just goes right out there and swims. That's what we're looking to see. We'd like to see a dog that has confidence and, and a desire to swim, where they just walk right out there, start swimming. Getting the bumper or not getting the bumper doesn't matter. Um, we use that to entice them, give them something to go after. But if they just turn around and come back, that's totally fine. Or if they grab the bumper, that's fine. So then you, you get the bumper back or, or grab a new bumper, and do the same thing. We want to see the dog swim twice. If there's any question in their mind whether or not the dog actually had its rears off the, of, of the ground or whatnot, we may ask them for a third one. And that's no problem. I mean, it's no, no fault of the dogs. Just need to get it out there a little bit deeper. And we like and then have them come back in and get them back under control as far as getting a hold of their collar. Now, a dog can do have many reactions to that. You can have dogs that, you know, jump and dive in the water. They can't wait to get there. And then you may have some that just very methodically and quietly just go out there and get it. That doesn't matter. It's the dogs that what you are looking for that could cause a little bit of trouble is the dogs that just don't want to go or they just don't want to make that transition from where they can feel the ground to where they can't feel the ground. They may stand there and stare at it or try to go look like they're going to jump in and they just can't bring themselves to do it. And at that time, we will tell them, we'll grab another bumper or, you know, talk to your dog, encourage your dog, grab a rack if you need to, you know, whatever it takes to encourage your dog to get out there. A lot of times what we see is once they make that final decision, like, oh, can we do it? Every swim after that's typically no problem. It might just take that one time. So you may ask to see additional um, swims after that just because you've had some hesitation. You want to give the dog the opportunity to improve that score. And so you might throw another one out there just to ensure in your mind that, yep, the dog's fine to swim, and he just had to get over that little hump. Um, if the dog just will not swim for anything that we're throwing, you know, throwing out there, or if it only swims twice, um, it, won't, it won't get that second swim, and you might see one but not the other. We may decide that, okay, at this point in time, we're going to um, put you at the end of the line, and we'll bring it back with a bird. So that's that's the, like the last last ditch effort, right? So we'll do the rest of the dogs, make sure all the water's clear of bumpers, and then bring that dog back down and with a bird. And then we tell the, we tell the handlers, all right, this has to be direct. It can't be the hesitation. It can't be, you know, the rock thrown or anything like that. You need the dog to just swim directly and get this. That's where we're at. And so you show them the bird again, do whatever you need to do, get them excited about it, and toss it out there in swimming depth. And... The dog's under judgment then to see how he how he responds. If he just goes right out there and brings it, gets it, and brings it back in, or at least swims without the hesitation, then the highest you can get at that point, if you had to go to a bird, is a two. That's the highest score you can get. But at least you're you're in passing territory, and um, and it helps the dog too at the same time, rather than just leaving it on a sour note where he he balked, he didn't want to go, and then leaves. You know, at least you're giving him another opportunity to show him also that he can swim. It's not that big of a deal. You know, you'll, you'll be okay. So am I missing anything on that, Angie? 
No, no. And we, we generally give the puppies plenty of time because sometimes, you know, they, you know, they're a little distracted um, and you just want to make sure you have their attention. I do want to add, you cannot bring your own bumper. You cannot, we cannot use any type of dockins. It's basically the bumper that the chapter has provided. Um, No treats. Yep. Yeah, no treats in your pockets. I, I've seen some handlers come to the line and try to use a treat. Um, there's Treats is a training aid. Um, so no treats in the field or in the water portion at all. So if you're coming to a NAVDA test, just don't have any treats in your pocket. Have them in your truck and, and say what a good boy or good girl they are after each section of their test, but don't bring it out in the field with you. And again, don't you can't have birds in your pocket or bumpers in your pocket. You have to use specifically what is supplied by the chapter. But the huge key, like Lisa just touched on, is get them good and excited. Get them focused. I've seen puppies, some handlers let puppies go, and all they want to do is they just want to go back in the field or they just want to go do their own thing or run circles around the pond because there's Tweety Birds or there's sparrows or, you know, kill deer or whatever the case may be is try to get them focused on that bumper. So expose your puppies young to bumpers. Um, I've had so many handlers say, well, my dog won't swim for a bumper. Try to expose them as early as you can in their life, even as I do it as a breeder. I have little baby bumpers that they just to get them excited to start learning and, you know, cultivating that retrieve in them. Um, And then, you know, at least they want to go out there and try to get it. They know what a bumper is. So expose your puppies early on to bumpers prior to you getting to the test. You don't want when you get to the test that first day and for them never to have seen a bumper. Um, Bumpers are easy to get. Right. So make sure that they have that, that uh, at least exposure to it. And again, they don't have to retrieve it. Um, they don't have to bring it all the way back in. We have pickup dogs for that that will that are more advanced and go pick them up for them. We just want to see that their four little feet get off the bottom of the ground and they start swimming and that you can reasonably call them back and get that second throw in there. A, a, a little bit off topic, but not because I don't want to get too much into training advice. But what has been for you guys your personal experience or your advice with um, puppies that have been given birds to retrieve in the water before they've had bumpers or even in general before the NA test? And has have you seen that affect anything? Would you advise one way or the other? I would advise against it <laughs> because you do, like Angie was saying, if you use a bumper, that's what they're going to see in the test. Yeah, they don't have to retrieve it, but at least it's, it's something that they know and they've seen it. You start using birds, that may be what they, their expectations are at this point. You don't want to get to the point where the only thing they're going to go for now is a bird. So building up that confidence with swimming by using bumpers helps them with just the swimming aspect of it and not the bird aspect. Of it. You know, he'll, he's swimming now because swimming's a okay versus, oh, there's a bird out there. And it could really adversely affect your score. I mean, affect your test day. Because he may just say, nope, that's not what I want. I want the bird. Sure, you'll, if he goes for birds, you'll get a score. But the highest you can get at that, that is that too. So try to avoid that and start early with, with the bumpers. And one other thing I would suggest for training purposes is go to different water. Don't just go to the same water every time, and unless it's the water you're going to be testing on. But don't just – we. the reason I say that is we had a test, and a gentleman, his dog would not swim, would not swim, would not swim, would not swim. At the end of the day, he says, I live on a lake. This dog swims every day. It was the picture. The dog was only used to that water, and that was it. And he brought him somewhere else. It was a different picture. It was bigger water. Nope, wasn't going to go. So another part of the training is make sure you go to different areas just to help them with that as well. Great point, Lisa. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I have seen it as well. Like Lisa said, you know, they just, they're so used to those birds 
um, that they just want to go for the bird and not the bumper. And, and swimming really is, you know, it's a, a focus thing. It's a desire. It's more the desire, you know, just to have that confidence to get their four little legs again off the ground and go swim. And it doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to chuck the dummy 50 yards out there. You know, the judge is going to tell you what swimming depth is. They can do what I like to call the paddle board where their heads are high and they're splashing. We're not judging stuff at all we just want to see that down the road they have that ability to to swim that they they're not afraid of water and they have that desire so you know really using a bird at the water is really our last resort and so when training for it I don't ever use a bird at the water when I'm training my own dog um I, birds are for the field Okay. Um, and yes, eventually we get to that point, right, where we're doing mark to retrieves and we're doing duck hunting and stuff. But that's that little more advanced training we'll talk about for the utility test. This is the foundation part. We want to make sure your dog overall has that desire to get in the water and leave you. You know, they have to leave your side. They, you know, you have that bond with them, which also, again, is in the field and the search portion we judge. Um, you know, they have to have that little bit of desire to go out and search for that bird or go swim for that bumper. So again, a lot of his exposure, um, I can't stress enough to get with NAVDA members, somebody that have ran the test before. Um, there's a NAVDA a natural ability video out there on the NAVDA international website. So Lisa and I have talked a lot today about the testing, but sometimes I'm a visual person. So maybe you can take what we've said and put it with this video and you're going to see what we're looking for. And again, if you can attend a handler's clinic, um, I, I can't stress any of that enough. The information is out there. It's how you uh, decide to go get it. Um, and again, there is that, that happy balance, but there's so many people that are willing to work with you to help you get there, even your breeder. If your breeder is telling you to go run a natural ability test, say, all right, well, what's involved? You know, and that breeder is going to be able to give you some advice as well. So again, I can't, I can't stress enough that, you know, to rely on the system and that we're there to see the very best out of your dog. And that judging team at the water is going to make sure and do everything they possibly can to get your puppy to swim. I mean, I've pretty much done acrobats to help puppies get excited to swim. And, you know, you can basically do anything. This is when I tell grown men to act like, you know, little kids and get that high pitched voice and get them excited. And you can do anything you need to besides you jumping in the water or throwing your dog in the water. We don't want to see you pushing them. We don't want to see you picking them up and throwing them. That's not going to go over well, folks, but let's, get them excited with that bumper and expose them to bumpers. Please expose your puppies to bumpers before the test. And what about when they, um, well, first, I guess on the, re when they bring back the bumper or if they don't, if they're running, if they are swimming back with the bumper and they come out and they run away with it, <laughs> is that going to count against the cooperation score or anything? If well, when we started talking earlier, I think I mentioned that your uh, desire and cooperation were being judged throughout the entire day. <laughs> it's judged throughout the entire day. <laughs> okay. Okay. So a dog that, you know, the desire score is a dog that, that's hesitant. You know, he's not really sure of himself. And uh, the cooperation is things like you just mentioned, a dog that wants to play keep away or he's not going to let you catch him for nothing. <laughs> I, it's my prize. You're not getting it. Yeah, we're going to start watching that, and it could certainly affect the scores. But it's not required to retrieve to hand by any Absolutely not. No, no, no. It's just getting the dog back to you at some point in time. Like I said, we're not judging obedience, but it's still a cooperation, you know, to come back and, and be it. Again. Yeah. again. Yeah. And I would say if you know, you guys know your dogs, if you know that they're super excited puppy and that when they get that bumper, they're going to run off. I suggest getting another bumper in your hand and pretend like you're going to throw another one. And this is where I call it football. So you have that bumper in your hand and you're getting ready like you're going to throw it again. Reach over, grab the dog in the collar or drop the bumper right in front of you so you can tackle your dog. That's going to help you with your cooperation. <laughs> Because you know your dog, right? You know, oh my gosh, there's sparrows and killdeer flying everywhere. Or they're going to grab that bumper and they're just going to take off and not going to want to come. 
um, have another bumper like you're going to play this game again because even though you're only throwing it twice, you know, they may think, hey, I get it again. That's when you trick them. And then what about um, as soon as they are done with that water portion? This is when you have the physical attributes. Yeah, that's what when can we expect to be done there. Yeah, that's where, you know, you as a handler, as a puppy owner, um, I like to say what we're doing is we'll tell you to leash up your dog and we're going to check physical attributes and we're checking the coat. And we like to do that after the water portion um, in natural ability and utility to check the coat to see its denseness or if it's soft or it's harsh. Um, and a wet coat gives us a little bit better opportunity to judge that in a dog. Um, and then we also check the teeth. You know, we check, you know, do they have all their teeth? Are they missing? Do they have an extra? What does their bite look like? Um, you know, there's, is it an overshot bite? If is it an undershot bite? Um, the one thing I will say is every judge, when you bring your dog to a natural ability test is going to want to check the physical attributes, touch your own dog's mouth get in there, open up the mouth, run your finger on the teeth, let them get used to it because no judge wants to get bit. And if we have a hard time judging the teeth or even petting your dog, in the end that can, you know, can look at the overall temperament of your dog. So practice that as well. And it's super easy. You can be sitting watching TV and call your puppy up and run your finger along their teeth and pick up their gums and look at it. Um, that way then they're not, you know, totally freaked out when judges come and look at the teeth. Um, and for me, if there's an extra tooth, if there's a bite issue, if there's a missing tooth, I'm going to show you as a handler. So you know what we're looking for, but it's that overall picture too, again, for the breeder. So they know what they have. Um, we're looking at eyes, entropic, extropic, if there's, you know, some tear duct issues, if the, the eyelids inner or if it's out, that could be the overall, this is the overall judgment of the health of the dog um, so that you know if there's an issue. If there's not a good coat, say we judge a coat open, you know, there's a concern there because when you take them out hunting, are they going to be able to withstand the briars and the cattails? And it's again, a picture for you and the overall health of your dog. Um, we're not, we're not vets. We are trained on this, but you know, we want to give, again, the breeders, the handlers, what we see in our judgment as far as that, again, that overall health, how they're going to hold up. You know, if it's a bad bite, if it's a butt bite where the teeth are grinding together, you know, a butt bite is, you know, the top of the, the mouth and the bottom of the nose mouth are together and they're grinding. And, you know, if you have a year old puppy and already there's wear on that teeth, that could be an issue when that dog gets 10 years old, right? So, that stuff that we're looking for. And again, you said it earlier too, Courtney, you know, they can leave the, the breeders and it all looks fine, but their development changes throughout their life. And sometimes they can change one way or, or another direction. And that's what we're looking for um, when we're doing that. So, but the big thing as a handler is get your dogs used to other people putting their hands in their mouth, touching them. Males, we check to see if they have both testicles um, sometimes they don't drop and young puppies, they may not drop. Um, I've judged a five month old puppy and it's hard to judge teeth because they still have puppy teeth. So we mark on the scorecard puppy teeth. Lisa, what do you think? No, you covered that pretty well. I mean, as far as, you know, you're just checking the overall physical soundness of the dog and, and like the coat, you know, how, if it's going to help or hinder the dog in the hunting environment, it's important. And some of the things like the teeth, you know, those are, I think that it could be a genetic issue as well. So that's why mm -hmm. it's good for the breeder to know those things. And it's marked yeah. on the school card and it goes on their record. Now, and puppy, these are, I see one that's like overshot. As a puppy becomes a utility test, his bite's fine. Mm -hmm. So that change, mm -hmm. the delay, it's a delay in uh, what you're actually seeing. So, um, but it's all written on the school card and it, it's good information for the breeders. Yep. As well and, as. It, right. And even. Um, you know, as a breeder looking for stud dogs in the future or owners looking to get a puppy from a breeder to be able to go and, uh, you know, locate those records and what's being produced from that stud dog. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just an incredible tool for, for everybody. And um, I think that's, that's a big advantage of testing in the NAVDA system that we don't give enough credit to is how important that is 
um, as a breeding tool, as a research tool. Those records are there for everybody to see. Absolutely. The database. Absolutely. It gives you all that information. And as a breeder that if you have stuff that pops up, you need to be humble and be able to take it. That is, is there public? <laughs> it's not, you know, like with OFA, you get, you, if you do the health clearances, you have that option to check the box that those abnormal results aren't public. But with NAVDA, when anytime that, you know, your dog is out there being um, tested, yeah, I mean, all that goes public record. You don't get the option to not make it public that, uh, my dog has a bad bite. My dog's missing a tooth. So it's, it's a, it's a great tool. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to stress that that doesn't affect your score. You know, right. we didn't really touch too much on, and you will learn this at Haler clinics and such, you know, it's basically one through four with a multiplier. And that's how we come up with, you know, a perfect score is a prize one, one twelve. but when we're checking attributes, that doesn't affect your score. It's just a snapshot of a picture. Yeah, and you're going to hear so much of different, you know, we're going to say prize one, prize two, prize three. And some people don't even know what that means, you know. And even if there's dogs that don't prize, I think we've all been there. Um, it doesn't mean you'll have a bad dog. It just means you just had a bad day. Um, and it's just really, we have such a short amount of time to see those puppies and those dogs do what we do. And we've covered so much today that it's, you know, that's the thing I can't stress enough is that you have the guts to even bring your dog out on a test day or put a bird and start training. Um, That's a big thing. You've already come a lot further than some other people have um, in in the bird dog world. So I can't stress enough how it's so um, awesome that people bring their dogs out and get them ready for a test and they test them no matter how they do in the end it's still your buddy for me it's my four-legged kid uh, I'm gonna take them home and we're gonna go out and have fun but it's just really a good snapshot of what what you've got and what our testing system is so I don't want people to get hung up on oh I got a prize two or I got a prize three or I did a prize it happens you know you know is a prize one you get a prize one yeah that's great but, you know, it doesn't mean you have any better of a dog than that no prize dog. So that's a really cool, cool thing about our system. And I think, I think too often we put that emphasis as in the person out there testing the dog. We want that maximum 112. And yeah. personally, I'm striving for that 110 getting docked in cooperation because that's my kind of dog. Absolutely. You know, I, wa- I want them with a little bit of fire that that independence. And so I'm like, I want my 110. Where can I prove my dog isn't cooperative here today? <laughs> no. Yeah, you, you can, you can always bring them in. You, you know, you can't push them out there, you know? Right. So absolutely. Right. Right. So I have some other things that I've are kind of like frequently asked questions or maybe just how um, to help people prepare for the natural ability test. And um, well, first of all, like what is what are some things that handlers should plan on bringing with them that day? Um, besides a crate to not have the dog running around their vehicle barking and chewing it up. <laughs> what else? Well, it's going to be a long day, you know, as Angie was saying. So you want to be prepared for that. So having a crate, like you said, or, or a steak out of some sort. You also want to bring um, most places have chairs or picnic tables, but bring a chair. Bring a chair. Um, a lot of, now with COVID, like we were, you could we usually count on lunch being provided. And um, now with COVID, it's not as common. You know, some people are not doing it or they'll do box lunches. So I would, you know, test secretary, she should send that information out to the handlers, but be prepared for that. You may need to bring yourself a snack or something to drink, bring water for your dog, a, a good container for the water for the dog out in the field. And whatever else your, your dog may be, just count on a long day. And also sunscreen, you're going to be out. It could be a very, very hot day. and You're going to be in the field for a while, both for, for all portions of the test. So be, be prepared that way as well. And what am I missing? <laughs> what am I missing? No, no, that's good. The, the one thing is do not bring shot collars. Um, your dog cannot have more than one. It can only have one collar on when it's out in the field. So don't have shot collars. This isn't a training day. 
Um, you know, if you have your shot collar with you and after the test is over and you want to run your puppy, you work that out with a chapter, that's fine. But the dogs cannot have a shot collar um, when they go out in the field. They can only have one collar on. If they have a Seresto collar, that's okay. We understand that. Um, but the big thing that I always tell handlers is out in the field is make sure you have water with you. If it's raining, and again, I said this earlier in the podcast, but if it's raining or it's hot, still have water with you. It's that good time. Like if your dog's just running wild and they're puppies and they're out there, you can call them in. The judge may say, hey, call your dog and give them a little bit of water. It just gets you that reconnection again with your dog. Give them water, even if they don't think they need it. They're going to be so amped up and it's, it could be hot. You, you know, you got to make sure that they're well hydrated. There's there's nothing against calling your dog in. You can't, if you call your dog when you're out there, do you call your dog when you're hunting? I sure do. So go ahead and do it in the test. And again, we're going to tell you if it's too much or if it's hindering the dog. We're there to help you. But the big thing is have water with you. And, and again, like Lisa said, plan for that long day. Um, that's the key. I just mentioned rain too. So rain gear is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and there was, um, uh, wh- when I walked into the field portion, um, I w- on one test, I had a slip lead on my dog. So, yeah. oh, it, wow. so it's required to have a buckle collar and yeah. a snap. What would you call the snap on leash that yes. snaps right into your. Correct. Collar. Yeah. We don't, as the slip weight can be used as a training aid, so again, that's why we don't allow that. So you just want a buckle type collar, you know, a flat collar. Uh, for puppies, when you're bringing the dog say, to the tracking area, you can use that suitcase tile, style of, of holding onto your dog, and that's to help keep your dog under control on your way to getting out to the field. But um, that's only allowed for the NA dogs. Other than that, it's just straight collar and leash, no, no training aids. Yeah, absolutely. Again, keep those treats home. Yeah. <laughs> no treats. No treats. <laughs> In the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about, uh, Angie, I think you just kind of touched on it a little bit, but how much can we talk to our dogs when we're out there in, in all three portions? You know, I, I tell every handler when I'm working with them, because when you get up there, you're going to be assigned a judge that will work with you, and they're going to work with you throughout the whole day of your test, whether it's natural ability, utility. Um, Invitational is a little bit different, but um, talk to your dog like you normally would. And if it's, again, if it's too much or too little, we're going to let you know. Like, if you're constantly calling the dog or say, do you need to hold off on that whistle a little bit or hold off on that call? Um, we just want to see what that dog does naturally. And what we're looking for is, you know, is the dog out there searching on their own? I've seen so many handlers where they can over call and they're calling them off a bird. So keep, you know, if we're going to tell you, and we know you get nervous, I do it again. I call too much or I whistle too much. And even as a judge, I've had fellow judges say, Angie, do you really need that whistle? No, I don't. But you get nervous. (laughs) And that's what we're there to help you. So yes, you can call your dog in. There is never, ever a penalty for calling your dog in and giving them water. I've had so many handlers say, well, can I give my dog water? Absolutely. We don't want anything happen to your dog out there. You know your dog best. And as I tell handlers, you know, you probably don't want me doing CPR on you or your dog. So bring water for you and your dog. Um, It's very important. And it's it's not a deduction at any point. Um, and on the scorecard, there's nowhere does it say handler, but at some point you could be affecting the dog's overall performance. And we're going to tell you, and we're going to warn you. Um, we'll tell you a couple times. Um, and then after that, it's kind of, it's your test. You know, you roll with the roll. Um, but again, we're going to tell you, and talking to your dog is absolutely no problem. Petting them, calling them a good boy, good girl. It's no problem. Not at all. Except in the tracking portion, right? You want to stay quiet? Right, right, correct. Yeah, you just okay. want to, you don't want to call them. But when they come back, you can give them a good boy or a good girl. What about maybe like an ideal age to test the dog? I think so many times, um, you know, people will wait till the test is held at their local chapter and maybe that's not until the dog's 15 months old where it may have been ready to test at six months old. So at what point do you say, 
or can you identify my dog is ready to test now? And is there typically about an average age where in your judging experience, you've seen that that would be most ideal? I personally do not like to put an age on it whatsoever. It's when the dog's ready. Like I said, when my dog is ready. And at different rates, the amount of exposure is going to change based on your schedule and what you can do and how early you can start. So it's when the dog's ready. You know, if you, like when people will ask all the time about how soon do I put a bird down for my dog? When your dog's ready. <laughs> I don't put an age on that either. So you want to get your dog used to the environment of a field and see that they're starting to get the confidence to get away from you. And that's when I say, okay, now you can start putting birds down. You test your dog when your dog is mentally and, and ability-wise ready. So it may be a four-month-old dog, like Angie said earlier, or it may take until that dog's a little bit older. He just may not have matured enough. You know, I've seen dogs where they're not pointing at seven months old. And then you see them again, and they're 12 months old, and they're a rock star. So it's just the amount of exposure you can give your dog and your dog's maturity level and, and confidence at that time. Yeah, and, and it depends when your dog is born. Um, you know, especially living in the Midwest, you know, if my dog's born, I had a puppy born in November. My Izzy dog, um, her her daughter Brandy was born in November. And, you know, she she turned six, seven months old in the summer. Um, I had no way of practicing swimming with her, you know, at four or five months old because the water was all frozen up here. Um, you know, so that's one thing to take into consideration. It, it just depends where you live. You know, there's 85 plus chapters across the country and Canada. Um, there's different places like in the Carolinas and in California where you guys can test all year long, um, where in the Midwest is a little bit different. So it really depends when your puppy's born. But again, it's, you know, your dog, you know, when they're going to be ready. And if you're new to this, ask somebody, talk to your breeder. Um, I, you know, last year I had a puppy from my bloodline test at four months old and five months old. I personally test a dog at nine months old. It's just when you know that they're ready and what you're looking for. Would you recommend taking the drive then of going to a different chapter if it means your dog is ready now versus waiting um, when maybe that dog has proven it should be advancing in its training at that point? Absolutely. You know, if there's not a test in your area. So when um, the puppy that I ran was five months old, um, I went probably four hours away um, from my home, which, you know, is a lot for some and not a lot for others, but that that puppy was ready. And sometimes every dog is different, like people, like kids, you know, they where if you can get them, whether that at that puppy stage, some puppies can handle that type of pressure and they just have that natural ability and that exposure and that desire. So at four or five, six months old, you know, you know that they're ready, go test them. I can't tell you the number of people that have said, even in the Midwest here said, oh, I should have just drove to North Carolina and tested them when they were five months old. They were so much ready. Now they're 10, 11 months old and they're holy terrors and they're tearing up the field and I had a better point at five months old than I did at 10 months old well that's because again they're learning you took them hunting you're training they're developing and they're like woohoo full tank of gas I'm out of here so it's again you I can't stress enough you know your dog and so in a heartbeat and I've learned this if I have a puppy born in November and it's ready to go and if I can test it in March or uh, even April in North Carolina, or I will, I'll go and do it. Um, because that's probably for me when the best time is to test them versus at the end, closer to that 16 months age when they're either taking out birds or they're just too far beyond and they're ready for, you know, that advanced training. So another difficult um, perspective with that too is, and I think a lot of novice people that haven't tested before, they wait too long to enter a test because they tests do fill up fast um, with many chapters. And so when their dog is finally ready and they go to enter a test, it's been full for six months, maybe. Yeah. And <laughs> it, it, so it's, it's right. It's, it's a, it's a fine line because so you can try to enter nine months in advance in a test just to find out your dog might not quite be ready yet so 
how do you work how do you work that out what do you guys recommend or when should people start looking to send in their entry for a spot yeah you know things have changed so much um navda's membership like i said we're going to hit that 10,000 mark here if we haven't already pretty quickly Um, And there's so many more breeders requiring, requesting that you test your puppy. Um, It's truly amazing to me, again, from 10 years ago, how fast, when I first started testing and judging, how fast the tests are filling up. I'm running a two-day natural ability test at my house at the end of May, and it was over half full a week after we put it on the NAVDA website. Again, because, and you got to attribute that to our growing membership and our growing um, breeders who are requesting this, this evaluation of their breeding program. So I would say that for me, if I'm telling my puppy owners to, um, I'd start looking at dates on that NAVDA calendar when it, one, might work out in my schedule, and two, um, when I think my puppy might be ready. It is. It's a fine line, and it's really a personal decision it's really hard to say, okay, at six months old, you should test your dog. Because again, like we discussed it, it, that generally may not be the case, or it may be the case. But I would suggest, you know, that mid, anywhere from four to nine months range, trying to find a test and get them in there. Um, Because by then, you're going to probably know what you have um, in your puppy, but do it early. I signed up for all my NAVDA testing this month. Um, and I'm not running until September, August. Um, I'm running a couple of utility dogs this year and I've already sent in the entries because I know how fast tests are filling. Um, so you really do have to plan ahead um, and, and talk with the chapter secretary. If you're looking in an area, generally on the website, it will say who the test secretary is. Shoot them an email or give them a call. Find out what type of entries they already have. Um, some chapters offer testing to their members first. So I would call ahead and start planning well ahead. Um, generally, if you're looking one month before to get your dog into a test, it, it's highly unlikely. It's possible because you do have drops. Um, some chapters decide to add an extra day or an extra test, but plan ahead the best you can. What about the dogs that you guys are getting um, in for the natural ability tests that have already broke, been broke out and are steady. How, how are they judged? Do they get an advantage or do you not want to see that? How? It doesn't matter. We don't judge them any differently. I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't hurt or harm. You know, we know that they're steady and say dog, you know, we, we kind of expect after the bird goes up, the dog's going to chase and the dog stays steady for the entire thing. That's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt or harm. No, not at all. Most NAVDA chapters have training days, whether it be once a month or maybe even some do it every weekend. And how do you suggest that people get the most out of those training days? Because they're they're showing up, you're usually signing on a sheet, you've you've reserved um, birds in advance, and... um, You're showing up, getting in line, so it's your dog's turn to come out and get those maybe, what, three birds that you reserved in advance, but how are you suggesting people get the most out of those training days? Well, for me personally, I say, you know, you get out of a training day what you put into a training day. So, for example, um, if you just have a lawn chair and you're sitting in the back end of your truck or sitting in your vehicle and it's your turn to go run your birds, that's okay. But I also think you're going to get more out of it if you help. So let's say, okay, you're working field. And, and each chapter might have a different focus. Maybe one, one training day they're focusing on obedience. Be as involved as you want. When I first joined the NAVDA chapter in 2003, the Southern Minnesota chapter is what I joined Um, I wanted to be as involved. So I, every person that was training their dog, I asked if I could walk along. Can I point a bird? When I go to, uh, you know, check for gun sensitivity, can I shoot the gun so I can see how a dog reacts? Work with the chapter. Um, I follow every single person that's training their dog that will allow me to follow so I can pick up what they're doing. So I think 
your listeners are going to get more out of being as active as they possibly can in a training day. So even though it's your turn, you go through your turn, then go with the next person's turn and volunteer to plant that bird or, you know, help if you're getting ready for a duck search for utility, get volunteer to put that duck out. Um, and if you're a more advanced gunner, you can go ahead and help shoot, you know, those birds for utility. Um, and it just, Again, you get to see so much more the more involved. It's the people, and I'm going to say this from our personal aspect, um, you know, I had a family member come to a training day, and they said it was boring. All I did is sit around. Well, again, you didn't put as much into it. You didn't go out there in the field and follow every dog, because every dog does something different. Every handler handles differently. And then rely on your NAVDA chapter members. You're going to have so many that are advanced and maybe not as advanced and pick their brain. At the end of the day, you might all go to lunch or have a potluck. That's a good time to learn a lot as well. So again, put as much into it as you possibly can, because that's what you're going to get out of it. Right. agree with that. I mean, doing the body system is the way to go because you can't train your dog by yourself. You know, it, it takes, it takes more than one set of hands. So if you go out and you know, like I say, I'll meet up with somebody and say, okay, I'll plant your birds for you and help you out in the field. And then you do the same for me when it's my turn. You know, you can do that. It's getting out there, getting to know the people. The camaraderie is is wonderful to begin with, but everybody's there for the same reason. We all have the same goals it's to, to train our dogs. So just help each other out. And the more you see, the more you learn. You know, that's part of why I'm judging so much is because you see so much. So what one person is doing to train their dog to do something you may never have thought of before and and give it a try if it's something that you're having issues with. People will have all kinds of suggestions for you and you can pick and choose what things make sense for you, for your dog, and try it. And it's just, it'll make your whole whole time with the NAVDA with, when you're out there so much more enjoyable and, and productive. Yeah. And you hit on a good point, Lisa. It's the friendships that you make. It's the connections you make. I mean, how would I have our world ever have crossed if we weren't involved in our chapters, right? That's the foundation. That's the basis where it starts. And, you know, I have NAVDA judges and friends um, that are lifelong friends. Um, You know, there was 25 NAVDA members that were at my wedding when I got married in 2011. You know, it's those connections, you know, for me to say I have friends in California and across the country, I would have never had that if I didn't get involved with my local chapter, which then eventually led me to be a judge. But it's also those connections and those lifelong friendships to me that are basically priceless. And by joining a chapter, you're going to get that. If you want Future it. hunting buddies too. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and with dogs and with dogs that you know are trained that you're happy to hunt your dogs with. Oh, so true. So true. Yeah. You know, I'm hunting more and more with NAVDA members. You know, we're getting together. We're a network of people or, you know, I had a NAVDA member contact me yesterday and say, I'd love to go out to North Dakota with you hunting sometime. Can you point me in the d- direction? Absolutely. I'm going to point you in the direction. We're going to help. We're out there to help each other. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the cool part. And when I want to go, when it comes time and I want to go hunting out in Montana, Courtney, I'm going to be calling you up, but we have that connection, right? You're going to say, Hey, check out this area. I've never (laughs) shot a sharp tail in my life. And that is my goal to shoot a sharp tail. Oh man, I got a spot for you. I'll send you my Onyx pinpointing for that. See, see, that's how it works. That's how it works. (laughs) Yes. Bring wine. (laughs) that's easy (laughs) um and and I just think of you know when when we're so anxious to get to a training day and train train our dog um instead of just coming having your spot on the list and then pecking up and going home you know take note that you had probably two people out there planting birds for you probably two or three that are walking along with you helping you give you tips and training and mm-hmm. at minimum, learn how to plant birds and, um, and, and do that because it's, it's really helpful. The same people that are out there every week and doing all the work, you know, take note that they probably didn't even get a chance to work their own dogs that day. And, or by the time it's five o'clock that they just are too tired to even work their own dogs and nobody's hung around to help them. So Help. Yeah. 
Yeah, help and the growth. The growth is is amazing, and this could be a whole another podcast. You know, Courtney, the growth that you see and people coming with that first time in their puppy, they're scared to touch that pheasant. They're scared to touch that bird, and by the time the test is over, and they're pulling that pheasant from their dog or that bird from their dog's mouth, and they're touching it. And I've had handlers. It just happened a couple of weeks ago. They're like, "Woohoo! I touched the pheasant." I mean, that is a big deal because you're a first time handler, youth handlers, you know, young men and women getting into this. That's what these chapters are helping people get that experience, you know, that they're scared to touch a bird. And all of a sudden you touch a bird and they're like, oh, my gosh, I just touched a bird. I had one more question. What um, when people aren't necessarily happy with the score they got that day, when when should one consider retesting? Do you ever make that recommendation? That is on a case-by-case scenario, depending upon what the dog did or what he had issues with. Um, We love people talking to us about their scores, whether they're happy or not happy. And if they have any questions, we're very open. We will pull our scores out right then and there and tell them how we came to that conclusion on their score. So we'll talk them through it. And if they have questions about, well, should should I retry this? Should I do it again? You know, we may just depending upon what it is and just encourage them to make sure you get your dog over that home and certainly try it again. And there's nothing, nothing um, wrong about retesting and there's nothing to be ashamed of retesting. You know, like, like I said, my husband used to run our dogs and he didn't care about the score and I would rerun them. You know, I wanted to get that utility prize one. So that was my, my goal. And if that's someone's goal, then that's what they should go for. Absolutely. It's so on a personal personal quest and what you're looking for. Um, I've seen plenty of members and um, handlers and myself included. You get that prize three, you're happy, your puppy passed that day and you move on to utility. Um, And then there's ones that, you know, my breeder needs me to get um, a prize two or better in natural ability. So then at that point, if that's what your breeders are, you know, requesting or you decide, then you can go run again. Or if you feel like, you know what, my dog just had a bad day for all the scenarios we just talked about, you know, go ahead and rerun it. But, you know, it's natural ability. Let's not forget these are puppies Um, and puppies will do what puppies will do. And you know your puppy better than anybody else. So it truly is a personal um, choice to either rerun your dog or just be happy, you know, if you pass that day to move on and, and train for that next level and that next hunting. And I always tell people to, no matter how they dog did, you have an awesome puppy. Breeders are awesome. Go hunting. Enjoy this dog and uh, get ready for that next level in NAVDA. Perfect. Well, thank you, ladies, so much. Can you um, give us some resources where people can find out more about NAVDA, be able to locate where their local chapter would be, um, and maybe follow along on some of the happenings on social media? Well, the NAVDA website is a good tool. You'll have the testing calendar, and it'll have the chapters listed, and you can con- and information on how to contact them. So that's the best way to get started as far as where chapters are located is is on the website. Yep. It's navda.org. And I would also say, um, like Lisa said, the calendar is great. gives you information, the test secretary, where it's located. Um, The AIMS uh, program and test rule booklet that we've been kind of talking about today is online for people to see um, information about handlers clinic. Um, There's information out there about the NAVDA um, video that that NAVDA produced um, that you can actually see um, some of the situations that we've talked about today and what we're looking for um, when you test your puppy in natural ability. Um, As far as social media, I know we are out there on Instagram. We are out there on Facebook um, trying to update our members. Instagram is a very cool, um, it's given us a lot of, the power of the hashtag is very interesting. Um, I'm sure Tim Otto, our our publications master will say, you know, that the hashtag is very interesting for us and and the the hits and clicks that we're getting off of just going, you know, hashtag NAVDA, hashtag NAVDA International. You're going to, if you click that, you look, you're going to see chapters all over the country, pictures of them on training day and testing, even hunting, even when it's hunting season, people post pictures because they're so excited. And it's just, 
it's a really cool place to go to see what people are doing across the country. So, you know, join our Instagram page, join our Facebook page and, and really use the, the NAVDA.org website as your tool. Cause just about everything you need is out there, even down to the registry, you know, finding out pedigrees. I'm probably on the NAVDA website at least every day, if not every other day, even looking at my own dogs, like, what did I name that dog? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> use it. Um, it, it uh, Chapter locators, you know, if you're located, you know, somewhere in Ohio or in Idaho, it's going to show you where the local chapter is. Yep. It's going to tell you where there is a chapter and contact those people and use them as a resource. Again, it's going to lead to lifelong friendships and in the end, an overall better hunting dog by going through our system. Whether you test or you don't, there's some people that just enjoy training and that's okay too. Um, So use our system for training and uh, getting out there. And in the end, it's about hunting and that relationship with your dog. And even some people that don't hunt um, test and train through the NAVDA system and and, and really find, because they just want to see that fulfillment and those abilities happening with their dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've seen it where people that don't um, test or train or hunt all of a sudden like, I just bought a shotgun. I just got a text message the other day. Um, (laughs) A gentleman said, my daughter just bought a shotgun because, you know, she was out um, with me working. The dog is like, this is fun. Um, Or I've seen it in testing. They're like, I didn't know my dog could do this. I'm going to take it hunting. I want to see that ability. So we're actually developing new hunters from the youth all the way up to, you know, the older generation. It's truly that you know, R3 movement that's been talked mm-hmm. about quite a bit in conservation. And I'm a hundred percent product of that, that philosophy right there. Yep. My yeah. very first dog that I tested in 2007, I believe she's the reason that I started hunting. So yeah, there you go. That's, Ex- exactly. Yep. That's, that's what it's about. Yep. It's an incredibly welcoming community. I, I mean, as a breeder, I am 100% confident that whenever I send a puppy out the door, I know they're going to be in good hands anywhere throughout the country. As long as they join a NAVDA chapter, they're going to get help put on the right path. They're going to be welcomed. They're going to be surrounded by great people um, with a great mission to help you and your dog. So Absolutely. That is one of the best things is this, just the fact that it's not, it's not a competitive environment whatsoever. It's, Everybody's cheering each other on. They're, they're, they're rooting for you, and they're there to help you whenever you need it. And just great friendships. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, share it and tag me and someone that would benefit from listening. Please help me out by giving the podcast a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening from and hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Be sure to join me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you're interested in some Bird Dog Babe swag or gear that I rely on, be sure to check out the store on thebirddogbabe.com. And most importantly, don't forget to support the organizations that are working hard to conserve the birds you're chasing after and the public lands in which you hunt.